Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is one of Hollywood's most hardworking and respected actresses <laughs> who's been entertaining audiences for four decades in movies like Stealing Home, The Bonfire of the Vanities, Man of the Year, Law of Attraction, and Something About Her, and in dozens of TV shows, including Murphy Brown, Married with Children, CSI Miami, ER, Bosch, The Five Mrs. Buchanan's, Lost, Under the Dome, and of course, her unforgettable portrayal as Aunt Zelda Spellman for six seasons on Sabrina the Teenage Witch. On the stage, she starred in many plays, including Carnal Knowledge, The Mousetrap, The Lion in Winter, and the one-woman show Bad Dates. She's co-starring in the brand new TV movie, When I Think of Christmas, now showing on the Hallmark Channel. In addition to her busy career, our guest has always made it a priority to give back to the community. When she was in her early 20s, she gave up acting for five years to help create Momentum, one of the very first organizations in America established to assist people with AIDS. And she's also a founding member of the Celebrity Action Council of the City Light Women's Rehabilitation Program, providing desperately needed services to homeless women. I'm delighted to welcome Beth Broderick to our show. Beth, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. This is my dog, Roxy. She's also here on the show. Roxy, come here. Hi, um, Roxy. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. So can I put it in my will that you'll, you'll do the eulogy at my funeral? <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> Only in 50 years, not before. <laughs> okay. Beth, I have to start by acknowledging our mutual friend, the wonderful Bruce Ferber, who facilitated this interview. He's oh, appeared yeah. on our show twice, and you narrated his audio book, Cascade Falls, which I loved. I'm sure you know he's a huge fan of yours. Yeah, I love him so much. I mean, it's a mutual admiration society for sure. I love working with Bruce, and we've remained really, really tight friends over the years. You grew up in California, and after graduating from the American Academy of Arts in Pasadena, you did something unusual for a young actress who was already in California. You moved to New York to pursue an acting career rather than stay in Los Angeles. Why? I didn't really feel like I fit in in Los Angeles in those days. You know, I had red hair and this deep voice and, and I was an egghead. I loved to read and, you know, I really wasn't sort of a Hollywood type, which kind of bore itself out in New York when I became a social service delivery person for five years, you know. And New York was just so comfortable to me. Like everybody there read books and, you know, I just I really loved the the community there. And then, you know, when I came back to California, I was very much ready to be here, to be home and spent two decades here and then took another little jaunt to Austin for 10 years. And now I'm back in LA and I'm so happy to be home. You know, it's where I grew up. It, it's, it's a beautiful town and, and I love it. Now, Beth, you know you've been immortalized for your role as Aunt Zelda in Sabrina the Teenage Witch. It really highlighted your gift as a comedic actress. I've always felt that comedy was your ace in the hole or your lucky charm as an actress. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I completely and totally agree. I think be, being able to do comedy, being able to make people laugh and smile is such an enormous gift. And I'm so grateful that I've been able to do it for so long. And even in the Hallmark movies, you know, there's so much joy that we try to inspire and that we try to bring and we bring humor to it as, you know, whenever possible. You know, I think for me, they don't really expect people who, you know, I was kind of a bombshell when I was younger and then you're not expected to be funny when you look like that. So it was really kind of the trick up my sleeve. Was that, uh, was that I could also be funny, you know? I can tell you that you're still a bombshell. Aww. <laughs> Is it true that you were the one who told the writers of Sabrina to make your character a scientist? I did. I asked them to make her a scientist because at that point, so much of the, you know, kind of iconology on television was either, and, and I had played the dumbest girl on TV twice already in two different series, The Five Missing Buchanan's and Hearts of Fire, where I was just in miniskirts and I was just so silly and didn't know a thing. 
And so on Sabrina, I really was like, I'll wear the mini skirts, you know, and 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 bring that kind of, you know, kind of pizzazz to the role. But I want her to be a scientist. I want her to be an egghead like me because I'm an egghead. You know, that's where I live. I mean, I'm a reader, I'm a, an intellectual. And I really wanted for young girls watching this show to see that somebody could be both, that you could be attractive and also suit the smartest girl in the room and that you didn't have to, because there's that phenomenon in America of young girls when they hit about fourth grade starting to pretend that they're stupid because they want the boys to like them, you know, and we, uh, you know, in Hollywood, we have, we have, you know, it kind of immortalized those stereotypes. And so I really, really wanted it to, I wanted Zelda and I cannot tell you, and it on, honestly, Melissa and I will sometimes do these autograph shows and she's like, why does everybody cry when they come to your table? I'm like, I don't know. They just all cry. Like they meet me and they start to cry. But a lot of them tell me, have told me over the years, I became a scientist because of you. I became a business owner because of you. I was inspired by you to, you know, go out and really pursue academia. So that, that new, the message got through to a lot of young people. And hopefully, you know, there's new generations watching that show now. So hopefully they're getting the same message. Oh, I'm sure because you taught girls that they could be pretty and smart. Are you surprised that Sabrina has remained such a phenomenally popular TV show for all these years? You know, I am and I'm not. Like when I read the script, I was like, this will be a hit and I will be in it. And I don't know why I knew that, but I knew I would be in it. And I knew it would be Anne Zelda. And I knew it would be a hit. But none of us could have predicted that it would be a hit for 30 years you know, that it would just keep on striking a chord with people. I have fans that run up to me who are 10, 11, who are just now watching the show. So that, and, and this is not just in America. I mean, I was doing a movie in Cairo, in Egypt, and I look up and these four women are running towards me and they're all wearing, you know, the burqas and the whole thing. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, I did something wrong. I hope I didn't do something that women aren't supposed to do. Like, I was like, and they just grabbed me, started kissing me. They were like, Zelda, Zelda, Zelda. Like, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. It's a phenomenon in the Middle East, you know? Is Aunt Zelda one of your favorite roles? Definitely. I mean, oh, people that's... ask me that all the time. What's your favorite role that you've ever done? And I've been so privileged to do so many and so many movies that I enjoyed doing, so many projects that I'm still in love with, but there's no comparison to being on a show which has brought joy to young people for 30 years. You can, there is no better part, there's no better privilege on earth than to have participated in something like that. So that is my favorite show, <laughs> no, you, no doubt about it. Why did you leave after season six? I think Caroline and I, Caroline and I both really thought it was just kind of, you know, the Sabrina character was getting older and heading to college and there was just less for us to do. And we felt like I knew I would go on to do another series. And I thought that we had sort of taken that show as far as we could, you know, in, with our characters. You directed three episodes of Sabrina. Would you like to do more directing, Beth? I would, you know, but of course, when I was trying to get directing agents and all that, it was still in the time when women were not hired. I would go to these women's meetings at the DGA and everybody was just like, how do we get hired? No one will hire us. And, you know, there was like, oh, well, it's late script de delivery. Women don't have enough experience to work with a script that doesn't get delivered until two days before the shoot. Or, you know, like, so they had all these reasons that they couldn't hire women. And... I met with a couple directing agents and they were like, well, number one, you played the dumbest girl on TV for a long time. So people don't think you're smart. And oh. number two, you work more than any actor on the planet and getting directing jobs is going to be hard and you're going to take acting jobs and then we're going to have wasted our time. And I was like, you are totally correct. <laughs> I'm going to do that. <laughs> well, you are a very popular actress. You had a recurring role as Kate Austin's mother on Lost. 
Mm-hmm. I was absolutely addicted to that show, even though it got weirder and weirder every season. <laughs> Did you ever really understand what was going on in the plot? No, people would ask me and, you know, I was never see the script until I got to Hawaii to shoot whatever I was shooting. And people would ask me what was going to happen. And I'd be like, I have no idea what's happening now. Like, I can't figure it out. Like, It's very confusing. I mean, the actors were so wonderful, you know, and, and I, I, I really had a wonderful time doing the show. It was such a different role for me. I mean, I never really do those kinds of parts. So it was, it was a good experience. But I have to tell you, like when I auditioned for it, it was this beautiful, heartbreaking scene. And like, I looked up and the casting director was crying. They were all crying. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to get this part. <laughs> and then I'm waiting and I'm like, I call my agent. I'm like, I'm going to Hawaii tomorrow. And no one's called me for my sizes. No one's called me for anything. Like I, I maybe... Do you think the customer has worked with me before and just knows my measurements? And they're like, well, we don't know. We can ask. So nobody got back to us. So I got on the plane and went to Hawaii. And they're like, we need you to go to makeup right away. And I was like, well, I think I should go to wardrobe because like that's going to take a minute. You know, like makeup, we could figure out on the fly if we have to. But wardrobe, I, and they're like, oh, no, no, you're in a hospital gown. You're about to die. I was like, I'm about to die. And they're like, oh, yeah, you'll be dead by the end of the scene. I'm like, where's my scene? I'm like, <laughs> nothing. They just wheel me out and I die. Like, that was it. Unbelievable. Well, that show was just <laughs> too weird and yet, oddly, very addictive. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, Beth, you're currently co-starring in a wonderful TV movie on the Hallmark Channel, When I Think of Christmas. You also starred in A Perfect Christmas List, A Very Merry Toy Store, Romance at Reindeer Lodge, Blending Christmas, Christmas Sweethearts, and Christmas Town. I've seen them all. You are <laughs> something of a legend in the Hallmark Channel and the Lifetime Channel. What do you think it is about you that makes you so perfect for those wonderful, heartwarming roles? Gosh, I don't know, but I'm grateful that people see me that way. And I'm so happy that I get to participate in that world because it's really very meaningful to people. You know what I think it is? Hmm. Warmth. Your comedy is brilliant. You're beautiful, but you convey enormous warmth that makes people feel like we already know you. It's a very intimate capacity to convey to an audience on screen. I don't know if you're even aware of it, but it really comes through. Well, thank you. I think that it's very important to me to be real and to let my feelings show in those movies and to, you know, I'm always, I mean, I'm always like, I'm in love with Shanae Grimes Beach. I'm always in love with my movie children. They're all so wonderful. And so that love is, is real that I feel for them. And, and the, I love the material, you know? I mean, when I think of Christmas was a super big challenge for me because I have to sing the title song. and. And there was just, I just decided, you know, this is something that I say to myself a lot before I give a performance, especially something that's a challenge, you know, on stage or like singing that song. And I just said, dear God, please let me be undefended. Please let me be undefended. Because just letting that camera into my heart, into my pores, into what I'm feeling is, you know, is the best way I know to, to, to make that material work and sing, you know, both literally and figuratively. And so, because, you know, we all have defenses, right? We're all defended. We all want to, how am I being seen? Do I look pretty? Am I good? Am I this? And for me, my prayer is please let me be in front of this camera with no defenses, with no, no, no walls of any kind, you know? Well, it really comes through. You're not self-conscious and we can feel it. A lot of people may not be aware that you are also a writer. Your writing partner is Dennis Bailey, and you've written A Cup of Joe, Wonderland, and Literati with him. How in the world did you find time to write when you're so busy making movies and TV shows? Well, we we did find time, you know, and I don't know if you know, but I have a column now on Substack called Wit and Wisdom from a Woman of a Certain Age, and it comes out every 10 days, 7 to 10 days. And I have over 5,000 subscribers already. 
who read me every week. So it's been such a joy to do. So if people want to read it, they can just go to bethbroderick.substack.com and you, I, you can read a year's worth of articles there that have been a really joyful way for me to share my heart with my people. Do you think you'll ever write a book, maybe compile the best of the articles and, and write a book? I would love to do that. I mean, and sort of, you know, you know, Bruce is a big reader of mine. He reads every single column and sort of, you know, getting back into writing and getting back into the discipline of it and delivering an article when it's due has been a really, really wonderful adventure for me. And I think I'm definitely ready for a book deal. Yeah. I have a feeling it's going to happen. I understand you're going to be appearing as Bertha Pomeroy in an HBO miniseries next year called Love and Death. Are you allowed to tell us anything about it? Well, it's based on a true story of a woman named Candy Montgomery in a small town in Texas. And she ends up getting involved in a very gruesome murder. And so the story is sort of how that came about and what happens to her and to everybody in that town as a result of it. And yeah, I played Bertha Pomeroy, which is not, again, the normal part that I play. <laughs> not glamorous, not, I mean, they made, they went out of their way to make me as unattractive as they possibly could, because I'm supposed to be like this Midwest, you know, Kansas mom, who's really never been out off the farm. So it was a really big challenge for me to play that part. And I enjoyed it. This is the second miniseries I've done for HBO. And, you know, they're a nice company to work for. There's always such precision and grace and, and dedication going on from every member of the cast and crew. So, it, you know, as much as I love living in the Hallmark world, this this world on HBO is also super interesting. And, and I feel very privileged to, to be asked to inhabit it, you know. Well, I like that you're surrounded by professionalism because you're a pro and you're also in a brand new movie called One True Loves based on the hugely popular novel by Taylor Jenkins Reid. You play Francine and the word on the street is that it's going to be a huge hit. You must be so excited. It's exciting. You know, I mean, I'm so blessed to the, to work as much as I do and to in, in so many different veins and different mediums and of course feature films are a huge part of my life and I love doing them and I loved doing that movie and they were just amazing cast and you know it, it was a it was a privilege to be part of it and, and I think it will be a huge hit absolutely well I have a feeling it will be too I can't wait to see it you've also got a movie coming out called The Nana Project co-starring Morgan Fairchild Mercedes Rule and Charlene Tilton are you allowed to tell us anything about that? Oh my God, it's so much fun. It is so much fun. I play Kitty. I have pretty severe dementia and I, I have a really hard time remembering to put my clothes on. <laughs> so, oh. so Charlene Tilton's always like, Kitty, <laughs> chasing after me, trying to forget, get clothes on me before I get down the hall. It's just Mercedes rule is splendid, just radiant in this movie and it's just so much fun there's so many great people in it well I just love the fact that you're everywhere you know Beth when I look back at your career you've had an amazing journey and a tremendous longevity you've been able to very successfully reinvent yourself as an actress over the years you've demonstrated incredible versatility I mean listen to this in Stealing Home you played a young seductress in Timber Falls you played a religious fanatic who tortures people in Northern Exposure, you played a sexy doctor looking for a one-night stand with a colleague. In Bosch, you played a judge. And of course, you're one of the go-to girls for comedy roles. Are you happy with your evolution as an actress over the years? I feel so blessed, you know, that, that people have let me inhabit so many different kinds of roles in, in so many mixed mediums, you know, from stage to, to features, to mo movies of the week, to television series, you know, I've kind of been there, you know, I do Hallmark, I do HBO, like I, I do big features, I do independent features. It's, it's a privilege to be part of so many different projects and the fact that they have allowed me to evolve and to play different kinds of roles and you know that they trust me you know Hallmark was like can you sing I was like yeah 
they were like, okay, good. That, they didn't ask another question. They were just like, that's good. They didn't, you know, they didn't say sing for us or, you know, they just were like, well, you say you can, then you can. You know, that's, that's, I mean, how many people can, you know, I feel like I'm very trusted and, and that's really an honor. Well, I think you've earned it. I, I mean, when I look back at your early career as the blonde bombshell that wasn't very bright, could you ever have envisioned the career you're having now? I could, because I knew what my range was. The thing, you know, the trick for me, and you were completely right to nail it from the get-go, the trick for me was comedy, was the fact that I could do it. And that, you know, I could bring this bombshell quality to being just balls to the wall, funny. And, you know, and John Ritter was a great friend of mine. And he and I were, were from the old school. We loved banana peel. We wanted a lampshade on our head. Like if you would let us, we would just go crazy doing comedy. And that was so much, so much fun. But I knew I had range. And, you know, I knew that as I got older, that range would would start to exhibit itself. But you see, here's the thing. When I interviewed Lonnie Anderson, we talked about the importance to her of being beautiful and smart, Mm -hmm. which she tried to do on WKRP in Cincinnati. But she had great difficulty evolving past that and transitioning into the wide variety of roles that you play. And I don't know whether you give yourself enough credit for your capacity to completely disappear and just take on all of these different roles so convincingly that it's almost unheard of in an industry that keeps categorizing people and labeling them. You defied it all. Yeah, I I really am blessed. I mean, it's really kind of amazing that they let me, you know, be so many different things and so you know one of the things that i think really had had an impact on my career is the fact that i never really pursued a lot of publicity so i did whatever the network asked me to do whatever the studio asked me to do but i didn't really pursue much more than that because i never wanted to be overly associated with one thing Do you know what I mean? Like I didn't want to be overly associated with one series or one movie or one type of role. And so, you know, a lot of people were like, why don't you do more publicity and get more attention? And I was like, well, because I'm going to move on to another series and I'm going to move on to a different, another movie and I'm going to move on to a different kind of role. And I didn't want to be overly associated with one thing, you know? As you know only too well, Beth, the rules keep changing in the industry and many veteran actors with your level of seniority have told me that it's frustrating and frankly annoying to have to keep auditioning for roles when their body of work should speak for itself and they should simply be offered the parts. Do you ever feel that way? All the time. (laughs) I mean, there's a lot of stuff I won't audition for. You know, I'll guest star on your show, but you need to offer it to me. You know, like, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to, like, th- those parts, I just did one on, on Criminal Minds, and it was so much fun, but because they were just really respectful, and they offered to me, they asked me to come work with them, and I really enjoyed it. They're a wonderful team. All their teams are great. The actors, the crews, everybody's fantastic. So I enjoy it, but I, I, I'm at a stage in my life where, you know, I like to leave room for other things that matter to me. And so auditioning, just relentlessly auditioning for things that I don't really, it's neither here nor there to me, whether I do them or not, I just won't do it. I'd rather write a column. I'd rather, you know, talk to you. (laughs) I'd rather do a lot of things than that. But I don't think they're doing it to insult us. I think that since especially since the pandemic, there's a lot of people with hands off. So there's an assistant pushing a button. Yes, we'll accept an audition from that. Like they're not really even looking at who is on the table or who is this person. And so I think that it, that, that it's not that they're deliberately trying to insult us. It's just that there's not a lot of people paying serious attention. 
Well, I love the fact that you're in command of your career and you choose your projects. It took you quite a while to break through in the industry. And I think it's, this is just my opinion. I think it's because you were so different and unique. You were the redhead with the low voice and you were memorable. You were really memorable. So I'm just wondering, what advice do you have for young actors who are hoping to have a successful career? Well, you just use the word that I use with them all the time. And that is you you have to be memorable, <laughs> you know? And, and it took quite a while for people to figure out what to do with me. They would call my agents and they would say, she looks like an angel and she sounds like a siren and we don't know where to put her and we don't know how to use her. And like, it really became up to me to sort of teach them how to use me. So I did plays where I played the dumbest girl in the play. And I did, you know, I, I, I really let the industry see, oh, she could do that. Oh, we could do that with her. That would be good. The most important quality is for them to be able to go, you know, the redheaded girl with the voice. That that's everything, really. You know, really so you is. really have to know who you are and what you're bringing. You know, if I was going to an audition that I didn't think I would get, I didn't try to contort myself into the role. I just gave a great audition, went home. You know, I knew I was going to get it, but I wanted to have fun in the room. And for everybody to remember that I'm out there and this is not my part, but the next one might be, you know? Well, there's another thing, Beth, about you. I did my research. Your reputation in this industry is that you're a consummate professional. You show up on time, you know your lines, you're easy to work with, you have no ego, and you're kind to everyone. In fact, you were known for many years as the actor who sent thank you notes to every casting director who saw you it's clear to me that you've always had an instinct about the degree of professionalism that you want to convey and the way you conduct yourself. There's so much more than talent that goes into becoming successful, isn't there? Well, there is, you know, because there are people who are, I'm just, there's a million people more talented than me, but they can sometimes fall into the life is too short category, right? And when you hire me, you know, I'm not there to compete with the young stars of the movie or the film. I'm there to support them. I'm there to make them look fantastic. I was the young star and I'm not anymore. And that's okay, That that's okay with me. I mean, I, this is my job and, I'm, and I love it. And I'm there to make everyone feel good about themselves. That is part of the job. And I don't care who that is, whether it's the crew or the director or, or who it is. There's a, a company that I work for and, and every time I'm on, I'm on the set with them, you know, the people will come up to me, the prop people, and they're always like, oh my God, it's so much better when you're here. We love it when you're here. And I'm just thinking, what goes on when I'm not here? <laughs> what happens when I'm not here? It's because you're a team player. Mm. And I think that a lot of people let their egos get in control and they become too difficult to work with. And I just love the fact that you're known to be someone that helps the project get done. You're aware of budget, you're aware of time constraints, you know your stuff. It's just a tremendous role model that you are in any industry, not just the entertainment world. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm that girl who goes, I can get this for you in a two shot. We can say, we're gonna lose the light. Let me do, you know, like I'm that girl that's like there to help. You know, that is my job and I love doing that. And I love, you know, all of my movie children and all of the, you know, the crews that I get the privilege of working with, you know, I love my job and I think it shows, you know? Oh, it shows it for sure. It shows. And your reputation in the industry is golden with all the dozens of TV channels and streaming platforms out there. There's more work than ever before in the industry. And yet I'm constantly being told by actors that it's never been harder to make a living as an actor than right now. Why? Well, the numbers have changed. You know, what they pay has changed. People starring on series now are making a third of what I made 25 years ago. And, you know, the price of cost of living has not gone down. So, yeah, I, I think I'm really blessed. I mean, I'm so blessed that I've been able to make a, a good living all this time, all this time. But living in Los Angeles on the budget, you know, I mean, you used to, TV movies would used to pay like 150,000 to the leads. Now maybe they pay 35 or, or 40, you know? So like, 
you, when you try to amortize that over a 12-month period, it just doesn't go very far, plus you're paying commissions and taxes. And so I think for a lot of young people breaking in, it's very difficult. I mean, and I can remember being on Under the Dome and looking at the young stars and they were all like ordering gowns off the internet. And I was like, don't do that. Save your money. And I was like, do you, do you guys know what I made when I was your age? And I'm going to make it, you know, I made it to retirement age and I'm going to be fine. But it's, it's not been easy for anyone ever. So many people in this industry end up broke. Big stars end up with very little money. You know, you hear that story all the time. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's because, sad. you know, you go along making this amount of money and then you're still working, but you don't realize you're only making this amount of money. <laughs> and if you have the business managers and all the like things that shield you from the truth, it's easy to get lost. Wow. Beth, as I mentioned in my introduction, when you were living in New York in the 80s, you actually quit acting for five years to provide social services to AIDS patients. That speaks volumes about the kind of person you are. And as one of the gay men who lived through that horrible time in our history and who lost so many friends, I just want to thank you so much for everything that you did. Well, you know, it wasn't something like I didn't wake up one day and go, here's what I'm going to do. You know, that doesn't know how it happened. I was reading the paper and it said, you know, that there was a, a, a state senator who was putting a bill up uh, to quarantine all gay men. And I thought, this is not just an illness, this is a civil rights issue and they're gonna need a girl. If they come with the bus, I'm getting on that bus with those boys. So I like went down to the Gay Men's Health Center, which was one desk in a tiny little room with one guy sitting behind it. And I was like, look, I'm here to volunteer. I think you guys are gonna need my help. And he was literally like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we need a girl. And I was like, listen, you little shit, don't mess with me. Like, I don't want somebody alone, hungry, scared, frightened, abandoned. Thanksgiving is coming, you write my name down and you take my phone number. So he did. And then I got a call from a man named Peter Avitable. And he's like, are you really a woman? I need a woman desperately. I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. And I was like, you got it. I'll be there. So I went down to serve dinner at St. John's in the village on Thanksgiving night. And I had not met anyone with AIDS at that point. And the 13 young men that came in were in devastating condition. I mean, covered with carposies, just frail you know six foot four maybe 105 pounds and um and i was scared for a minute and i went to the ladies room and i was like you get back out there and you help those boys they are alone and you are not going to leave them alone and so i went out and i hugged every single one of them because everybody thought you could get AIDS from the air. And I was like, well, if I, we'd all be dead if you could get AIDS from the air. I mean, that didn't even make any sense to me at all. So, you know, I just took every one of those boys in my arms and you could see the impact of having a female speak to them and care to them. You know, these guys needed a mom. I mean, there was no, their moms had abandoned them. It was terrible. And at the end of that night, Peter threw himself on the ground threw himself around my legs and said, I'm starting this program. Can you help me? I need you on Tuesday. And I said, absolutely. And, you know, we started this program, you know, it was like, we had like hot meals and then we had free groceries. And then we ended up having a free clothing store because people would lose 40 pounds in 30 days and have nothing to wear. And so we just kept evolving. And we looked up one year, one Christmas, we looked up and like 200 people came through the door. Up to then we'd only had maybe 20 or 25. And I'm running down the streets of New York City, running into restaurants going, give me a ham, give me a turkey, give me a thing of soup. Like I have people following me down the street with big giant things of food because we had to feed 200 people. And at that point, you know, it went from a crisis to uh, an epidemic to a pandemic so quickly. 
and there was just no turning back. The, the, the situation was too dire and too desperate and there was just no better thing to do with my time. Nothing well, more important to do than that. It, it is such an honor and a privilege to have this opportunity to talk to you about that. Did working with people who were marginalized and sick and dying have an impact on the way you live your life now? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the pandemic, recent pandemic really brought back a lot of memories of how fear can drive people into negative places and to make people do things that are ugly and unfortunate and how people can get isolated really, really quickly when there's a lot of fear in the, in the air, in the ether, you know? And I saw fear make people do such terrible things. But I also saw, you know, and met more than my fair share of heroes, just everyday heroes. You know, I had guys in the vegetable district that talk like this. And they, you know, they went, the New York Times followed me around one day and they're like, the church girl, she needs the food. That's what give her the food. She needs the food. These people are sick. These boys are sick. Like they were just like, you know, give me whatever I asked for. I mean, I had, I remember going into a bakery one day and I spoke just enough Spanish to try to explain the situation to the owners of what I was doing. And they looked at each other and they went in the back and I thought, oh, this is dumb. These people don't have any money. I shouldn't have asked them. They, you know, I looked at, around me and there was just very few things left in the, on the shelves and they came out and they packed up every single thing they had and they gave it to me. You know, I can't tell you, I would get in cabs and they would say, what are you doing? What are we doing, lady? And I would say, well, I'm picking up food because I'm running a program for people with AIDS who, who are hungry and who need help and who are too isolated. And every single time they would turn the meter off and drive me for free for an entire day. So like there was so much that was beautiful and kind and, and amazing going on in the midst of what was also terrorizing and ugly. And, you know, we had a president who wouldn't even say the word. And so it has made me a lifetime devotee of politics. And I am always, 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 always making the argument that it absolutely matters who's in office because I've been there when the wrong person was in office and I watched thousands and thousands of people die on because of it. So, you know, that it has completely, it completely transformed my life. Well, when you talk about being blessed in your career, in your life, does it occur to you that you have a lot of guardian angels around you? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you believe in karma, but I do. And I think there's a lot of white light around you and it's because of the work you've done and also with homeless women overcoming substance abuse and getting job skills yeah i have my party coming up on the 15th this would be the 33rd year that my friends and i have provided the gifts for the women in the emergency shelter at the good shepherd home for battered women and uh, 33 years we've been working with them so and it's you know that's christmas to me and my sister and my friends we don't do gifts we don't do the rest of it we might make a turkey, but our Christmas is wrapping these beautiful gifts for these women who left home with nothing and have nothing to look forward to. And to they go to they go to mass on Christmas Eve, and then when they come back to their rooms, these beautiful gifts are on their beds. And you know, we send a little note: "We are thinking of you. We know you're struggling. You have friends." And so that to me is Christmas. It's makes me cry <laughs> to think about it. But that's, you know, that's how I like to operate in the world. Well, in a way, you are a human Hallmark channel. <laughs> yeah, and I got to tell you, I got to tell you, Miss Beth Broderick, this has been such a pleasure meeting you and talking about your life and career. There's so much about you that I really admire. There's such a lack of self-consciousness in you. When you talk about being undefended, what you're really saying is just let go and be yourself and let your own authenticity shine through. And in an industry full of phonies, you are an unbelievable breath of fresh air. And I just want you to know you've got a, a big fan over here. 
Oh, well, thank you so much. What a pleasure it's been to talk to you. Thank you for doing your homework and asking such good questions because, you know, these are things that it's important to talk about, you know, both, uh, both the career wise and in terms of social service delivery, you know, and, and writing and, and the importance of words and how we communicate with one another. You know, it's, there's a lot of ugly things in the world right now, but there's a lot of beauty too. And well, when you write your book, promise me, promise me you'll come back. I will, I promise. There's just so much about you that we could keep talking forever, but thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show, Beth. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And love to Bruce if you see him before I do. I sure will give him your love. Right. Our guest has been Beth Broderick, who's currently co-starring in the wonderful TV movie, When I Think of Christmas, now playing on the Hallmark Channel. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you to my management team in LA. Thank you to my team in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.